I'm very happy to be here. It's lovely to see you. And I have a sort of very simple recipe that sort of explains a little bit... Oh, thank you, Janet. Uh, explains a little bit about um, how I see my career. Um, I always say I have some talent. Um, and uh, don't laugh, I have some talent. Uh, I've always had very clear goals. Uh, and, and, uh, um, and I've always worked exceptionally hard. And I think I've done my preparation and all the rest of it. Although I have to say, today I was a little bit, a little bit short. Sorry about that, Darcy. But I'm here and I'm really looking forward to sharing some ideas with you. And I have for this very simple, simple recipe. So um, I'm going to just start with uh, Cambridge and maybe say to you, before I went to Cambridge, um, I was at a, a very nice boarding school. And uh, after my O-levels, age 15, I was, uh, went on an excursion. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And, um, and I went to Marconi Elliott uh, Aviation Systems Limited in the well-named Boreham Wood in Hertfordshire. And I was absolutely fascinated and came out of that knowing I wanted to be an engineer. Quite quickly after that, I was sort of diverted towards water I was very interested in. Never did my research in water, hydroelectric schemes, uh, and the dams that created the reservoirs. And originally, I was more interested in concrete, and I changed into um, soil mechanics a little bit later on. And I had a lot of help at that stage from men who mentored and sort of godfathered me, in a sense, to find me a company to go and work in before I went up to Cambridge. And I ended up being rather boring and not very diverse and got three degrees in the end from uh, Cambridge, and uh, enjoyed that um, very much. It's a little bit of a, a, a variation in the theme because I first went up to Cambridge, did the three-year bachelor. It was at engineering sciences, and you could choose civil engineering in the last year. I was at Girton College then. Absolutely fantastic experience. Uh, really loved it. Marvellous parties as well as lots of sport. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, then I went off to, um, I started working as a consulting engineer again for the same company that I'd worked for um, at this point here, just there. Um, and then uh, I was uh, sort of uh, headhunted by the professor of soil mechanics at Cambridge who said, you know, you won a prize, we want you back. So I went back to do a one-year master in soil mechanics and was so excited um, with the research, having thought before that I wasn't good enough to do research, um, being honest. Uh, and then I, I stayed on to do the, to do the doctorate. So um, now, in parallel, there was some of this going on. And um, I was quite a good sportswoman at, at school, and I represented uh, Cambridge in various varsity matches. I went off to, to Fiji. When I was in Fiji, I started playing squash and ended up playing for Fiji, and I... Um, ended up winning all sorts of running races there as well. I think the women were a bit more relaxed, um, and, uh, and that was sort of motivated me. And then I came back from, uh, from Fiji and did my chartered exams and started doing triathlon. Um, and then by the end of that year, I'd become an, an international triathlete, sort of. Uh, and then that happened a little bit over 10 years. Um, and when I came back to do my master in soil mechanics, they recruited me for squash because I'd done that in Fiji here and, uh, and also for the cross country and swimming and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So went on doing all of that um, and stayed on to do my doctorate. And so my doctorate was sort of done in parallel between being an international athlete and being, uh, and being a doctoral student. I had very, very understanding um, supervisors. They were all incredibly supportive. And I just switched off my salary when I owed them some months. I mean, you couldn't do that today. But then was really, I was extremely honest about, uh, about all of that. And it worked really very well. Um, and at the end of all of that, I got a research fellowship, a, a postdoc, and then an assistant lectureship. And then after three years, a lectureship in, in Cambridge. And again, all the time, I had a lot of support from my colleagues. So um, mainly, mainly men. Um, at the senior level, um, but a lot of female doctoral students starting to be interested in geotechnical engineering. So actually, it was a really wonderful experience for me personally. I think I was, um, I was very lucky, and I took an extra year to do my doctorate, I think, because I had one year out being a, being a triathlete. So that was all quite fun. And I just want to show you now a picture of my career path in Fiji. Um, that's, my, that's my dam. Can you see it there? 85 meters high, just under 2 million cubic meters. I, I went out there, and of course, you can imagine they're all looking at me. I was the only 
um, female engineer on the, uh, on the dam site. Um, a lot of Aussie and Kiwi guys who would come and stand in front of me and say, I'm not four-letter word doing four-letter word that. Uh, and, and, and so I had a very interesting learning, learning, um, learning process, but actually I think it was really very helpful. And we worked, we had four Swiss companies were involved in part of the, the tunneling, the switching station and so on. So that was also quite fun. And we produced from this dam, from the hydroelectric scheme, nearly 100% of the electricity demand, and now it's, it's, it's half of it. So it was really very, very important. It was a fantastic um, experience uh, to do that. Uh, and also, I should say, in passing, I learned um, very cleverly how to say no to lots of Fijian men who got very interested, um, and I managed it extremely well. I never had any major problems, but it was interesting um, how often I was invited to go nesting. So uh, that, was, uh, that was resolved. Anyway, um, then uh, I wanted to... I don't know why I wanted to put... What did I put that? Oh, yes, OK, so that was just... Um, um, I should have really shown that before. OK, so... Um, and those were the other bits and pieces that I, that I did. OK, so... Um, when I was at... Actually, I want to come back here. So I want to say, so I had male help here. I had male help here um, when I was suggested that I should become a research fellow. I also had a fairy godfather who said, please, will you go and do, do that? And then at the point when I was leaving Cambridge, I also had um, a recommendation from a colleague who was here who said, please, will you apply for this, uh, for this chair? So all along the way, I've had a huge amount of help. Now, what's this? This is a, a very interesting picture, which I'm sure I should have probably put Equal as the owner of this, which I apologize I haven't. Um, this came from Equal. And it shows the number of professors by gender from Etihar right from the very beginning, 1855, um, up to um, the current day. So um, I don't know why they chose grey to represent the men. I, I'm not sure. We are uh, sort of a rather attractive uh, colour. Um, and you can see sort of a lifespan for a professor at Etihar. Um, Flora Rushat Ronkati was the first female professor 130 years after uh, Etiha was, was founded. And when we were founded, by the way, we were open for women students at day one. Who knows the first year, year that women got a degree at Cambridge University? Does anybody know? Guess. 19. Yes, that's bad enough. <laughs> 40. Terrible. 8. And who was it? Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. Very appropriate. So... Etihar was actually pretty good, and we had a lot of female students in here, mainly coming from Russia, uh, um, uh, Serbia, so Einstein's wife eventually, and so on. Anyway, so first one professor here. Uh, Equal Opportunities Office started really quite early on. Um, I arrived in 1997, and I did a huge amount of uh, preparation. I had one of those dream um, presentation and interviews, I think also because I did a lot of preparation, and that set me up for a fantastic negotiation, and I ended up by getting um, how much more? Two times as much the money that they'd planned to give me for my, um, for my chair. I saw this as a theme that people are quite interested in, so that was quite helpful. At that stage, I was number nine, um, full professor at Eteha, woman, um, and then after that, um, you know, 10 years later, Heidi Wunderly was appointed as the first female rector. Um, and then I was the second and the first um, rector who doesn't have German as a, as a mother tongue ever since, also the whole, the whole way. So this also shows how international and how much ATH has changed in the 20-something years. Um, and today, um, the, the stats are about 15% or something like that. Um, still, not, um, still not good enough. But what I can say is last year, of the appointments that um, the president recommended to the Etihad Council, a third of them were women. Um, and so gradually we're changing. And yesterday, the Etihad Rat announced the, uh, the new numbers and of nine professors appointed at Etihad, um, four of them were women. And I think the nine that were stepping back were male. So we will uh, retiring. So we will change that number. It just takes a little time. Janet, you're in the picture, right in the middle. And I'm hiding right at the very back. You see, there we go. Janet's the boss in the middle. This is in my office and we try and have regular meetings um, of the women's professor. We had one also earlier on this week, although not quite so many people this time. So we work very, very hard. And I think what's happening is now there are more people to show the way. Um, there are more people to encourage and help the next generation. Um, 
And, and I think that's really very, very important um, because each generational context is, is, I think, is very different. And I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about mentoring, self, raising self-confidence and helping to solve problems. So I think what um, um, you've already heard is that networks are really, really important, like this one. It's absolutely essential, and I think it really gives women and also minorities a help um, to be heard and to make, to make progress. Setting up the opportunities are also um, very, very important. I had amongst my doctoral students, uh, one-third were, were women, and I think um, in those women, those women had between them something like, I think it was eight kids, and the men had uh, a similar number. And there was always an opportunity, uh, first of all, and I knew from my very first female doctoral student, she's going to tell me she's pregnant. Oh, my God, what do I say? <laughs> uh, and so fortunately, with the 30 seconds warning I had, I was able to, that's fantastic news, great. How are we going to help you? And she came back at 60% and eventually uh, graduated. So we, we, ta we tailored everything for each of the doctors and for the men as well. Like, oh, I have to have a day at home to help my, 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 my wife with, with the child. So, okay, no problem go down to 80%, and they said, actually, we're working 100%. That doesn't matter. I'll pay you 100%. So it's always about, um, again, setting up the opportunities, but also being honest about all of those things. And I think mentoring is really very important as well. We've all had a lot of experience, all of us, and uh, quite often we can help um, you by suggesting um, solutions to various challenges you face. Now, I've got a few silly slides that are, I thought might be quite fun. I think we have to invade the male networks, um, can you see the three women there? There's one there, one there, and there's one hiding a little bit. This is chemistry at ATH in 1910. Okay? We all know the stories about men promoting men and all of that, um, but still, it's up to us, I think, to, um, to take it on. This is, a more, um, this is from ATH week uh, last year. And you can see the balance is, uh, is considerably better. It's also very international. And, um, and I think it's up to all of us to seize the opportunities as well. I know, I think from my perspective, that was something I did quite well, was to seize the opportunities. And I'm sorry I'm talking a little bit too long. I just want to say one thing that helped me right at the very beginning was um, I was in the officer training corps. And, um, and my um, commanding officer of the time said that he wanted to, uh, to promote me, and he had to go and ask for permission from the Royal Engineers in order to do so, so I could be the first woman to command men in the Royal Engineers. And you have great opportunity when you do something like that. You put yourself a bit under pressure, um, but actually you learn a lot, and you can try out all sorts of different ideas, and it was really quite, um, quite fun. Anyway, here we go. So get into the driving seat. Um, note who's driving here. <laughs> Um, she set a world record from zero to 100 kilometers per hour, one of our um, student projects. This is the AMZ Formula Electric, and uh, she got to 100. So she's the fastest woman on the planet, probably, in a car like that. 1.513 seconds, and I think it's still a world record. So um, that's my message. Thank you very much.